Oh, sorry, now it's starting. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar, The Future Is Now. Um, we're uh, broadcasting on three different continents, so it's quite uh, exciting and a little bit nerve wracking. Um, we had some hiccups on the way here, but we're here and hopefully everything uh, will work as we hope it will work. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Sonne van Rijn. I am the ambassador for the Patient Association for HEHWAD here in the Netherlands. Um, some of you may know me, some of you in Australia may know me as well because we visited uh, Perth and Albany last year in 2020. So if any one of my adopted Australian family is watching, Hi, and I miss you guys, and I hope I can visit you again soon. Um, I'm going to give you a little introduction of the webinar and what we're going to talk about, and then we're going to start off with uh, our great uh, panelists here. Um, first of all, I want to give a little shout out to Ellen. She's from the Leiden team, and she couldn't be with us here today because of personal reasons, but she made a great effort to make this webinar happen. So I just wanted to give her a little shout out, Ellen, for everything you've done so far. And also to Karen, who is joining us today, who uh, is now helping me do this webinar in Zoom. So thank you for being here. Um, I hope everything worked out for people who are joining us. Um, if you don't see your own video, you're doing it right, because you're not supposed to see your own video. So if you see us, the panelists, you're doing it right. Um, you'll see on the bottom of your screen um, some options. And you'll also see the possibility of the Q&A. And through the Q&A, you can ask your questions. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A section on the end of the webinar because we're going to get uh, all the information out and then um, uh, share your questions. So Karen is going to gather them for me throughout the webinar, and we're gonna have some time at the end of it to um, ask them to our panelists. Uh, so the Q&A is where you ask your questions. It's private, so no one else can see them. It's just between um, you and um, Karen for now. Um, as you have noticed by now, probably the webinar is in English. We do that because we want to to make it possible for the families here in the Netherlands and families in Australia to be able to follow it and get all the information. Um, we are doing a recording of the webinar as well, which means that uh, you'll be able to uh, watch it later if you want to. And we're also going to add uh, sub Dutch subtitles later. So for anyone who has a little problem following everything in English live, you can watch it back later with uh, subtitles. Um, I just want to uh, let you know that it's possible that during the webinar, Marika leaves because she has a, a duty in the hospital. So it might happen that her phone goes off and she has to leave. Uh, Mark has to leave a little early and Ralph might have to um, jump out of the meeting for a few minutes for a radio interview. So if you see anything like that happen, you know why. Um, we're doing the webinar with the uh, theme, the future is now, because I'm sure most of you have gotten some information by now about the very vital developments in HHWAD research uh, in 2020. So um, all the people you're seeing now, the people in Leiden, people in Australia, uh, the people in America, we have formed a consortium with two uh, pharmaceutical partners. And um, it's very, very vital um, research that is starting this year in the Netherlands and in uh, Australia. So we wanna make sure that every family member that is interested in these uh, developments or is thinking about participating or is going to participate um, has every information they need, and uh, we hope we can motivate you to um, join us in these research projects as a participant. Um, 
We're going to start off with everybody giving a short introduction of themselves because um, probably the people from Holland don't know the people from Australia and the people from Australia don't know the people from Holland. So uh, we're just going to do a little round of uh, introductions and then we're going to get to the program. Um, Marika, if it's okay, I'm going to start with you. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, so my name is uh, Marike Werma. I'm a stroke neurologist um, from the Leiden University Medical Center, and I'm a PI of the uh, uh, Aurora study, which is a study that's still ongoing, looking at risk factors for disease progression in Dutch type CAA, and one of the PIs of the Leiden team uh, of the TREC, uh, the new study. Yeah, thank so, you. So hello, everybody. <laughs> uh, Mark? So Mark van Bruggen is my name. I'm a neuroradiologist by training, and I'm involved in the, uh, uh, the, research, the ongoing research here with uh, Dutch Type CA. Nice to meet you all. Steven? It's great to virtually see everybody. I'm Steve Greenberg. I'm a stroke neurologist at Mass General Hospital in Boston, and I've been involved in CA research for many decades uh, now and uh, am uh, just as excited as can be to be part of this consortium and part of uh, today's discussion. So um, thanks to everybody for joining us and thanks to all the hard work for putting this session together across uh, three continents. Thank you. Uh, Karen. Hello everyone, my name is Karen and I currently reside in the United States as well in North Carolina. I'm a physician assistant by training. And then on the personal side, I've been impacted by CAA having several family members diagnosed. And because of this, I started the US-based CAA patient advocacy group called CAA Cure three years ago, which includes a website and social media. And the purpose is to connect CAA patients and caregivers with doctors and researchers. Thanks for having me today. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Dini. Hi, I'm Dini Plug. Um, I live in Australia. I'm the representative of family. Well, I am now. I'm the representative of the family um, the plug family who carries the um, HCHWA gene. Um, basically, I am the face behind the people that, um, the people of my family that are involved in the study so far. And I also do have the resources to contact a whole lot of them, a whole lot of other people, which I hope to do um, through this webinar and also later on as well. I live in per uh, Tasmania at the moment, um, but my family, most of my family who are involved in this study live in Perth, um, but I, I pop across on a very regular basis. Thank you. So those of you in Holland who are wondering how it's possible that there is HHWAD in Australia, um, Dini's family moved to Australia from the Netherlands in the 1950s and they carry the gene with them so there is that's why their family over there is um, um, affected by the disease as well. Um, Hamid. Hello everyone Hamid Sohrabi from uh, Western Australia. I'm a psychologist by training and work at Murdoch University in Perth in Western Australia. Uh, very excited to be part of this and appreciate all the effort that Sane, Dini, Karen, and Ellen have put together to, to make this session possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Yeah, it's very exciting uh, to do this webinar. I don't know if people understand how, um, let's say, innovative this is. This is really a um, cooperation between patients or people uh, that are affected by the disease and the researchers and doctors involved. So uh, I'm very excited that we found the time to get together, all of us, and uh, we're doing this now. So thank you guys for being here. Um, we're gonna tell the story of HHWAD research or DCA, Dutch type CA uh, research, which is a lot easier to pronounce. So if nobody minds, I'm gonna say DCA from now. Um, 
We're going to tell the story, a little bit of the history of the research, which was mainly done in Leiden uh, for a long time. Uh, the development of research, uh, how Australia got involved in that as well, um, and how that led to the formation of the consortium in 2020 and uh, what that means, uh, what the new study track DCA entails and what it means for us as family members and potential participants in the study. Um, so I'd like uh, Leiden, Marike and Mark to kick off and uh, give us a short overview of the history of DCA research in Leiden and uh, explain to us why natural history studies are so important. Thank you very much, Salem. <laughs> Despite the instructions, I took the liberty to uh, share some slides with you. And uh, Marika and I will have this uh, um, presentation together. And basically, some of the people on board today may have seen parts of this because I gave this is part of the presentation that I gave in Perth about two years ago. So it's just to give some historical background uh, to appreciate even more where we are today. Um, okay, now, how do I to do it here? Okay, so you all probably know where Leiden and Scheveningen are. This is a very old map from the 17th century. We're all near the coast. This is the city of Leiden, and that is the closest uh, village on the coast uh, nearby Leiden, and that's uh, Katwijk. So there is a historical and geographical bonds. So in Katwijk, it has been known for centuries that in certain families, an early death by stroke runs. Then in the 1980s, uh, uh, a professor of neurosurgery, Professor Leijendijk, uh, he discovered that he uh, actually received many patients from Katwijk, and he started to wonder whether there could be something uh, genetical uh, underlying it. And so he teamed up with the local general practitioner, Dr. Timmers, and that led eventually to the discovery in 1990 in a uh, presentation on a, in a publication in Science, one of the major scientific journals in 1990, where they presented the case that they discovered a genetic um, defect underlying Dutch type CEA. Then in the 1990s, following that observation, there was a, um, all kinds of scientific activities. They started to describe the disease, both in terms of the, the symptoms and the signs, but also the manifestations on neuroimaging. They started to look at all kinds of other uh, manifestations of the disease. And uh, they basically also understood that it was based on a specific autosomal dominant hereditary defect, which means it has nothing to do with inbreeding because oftentimes, when you explain about a disease and that it originates in a, in a uh, small village, people think it's about inbreeding. It has nothing to do with that. So they discovered the roots of the disease were in Katwijk and Scheveningen. Probably there was a common ancestor uh, explaining why it popped up in two locations. Um, and uh, it was also discovered that the whole disease is based on a... Um, an abnormality in the small blood vessels in the brain. And that abnormality is accumulation of amyloid, a certain um, uh, peptide. So the signs and symptoms became clear when they looked into the disease. It's, the symptoms uh, started at about age 50. Uh, the presentation is oftentimes acute, uh, characterized by a stroke or sudden death. It can also be more gradual with uh, a cognitive loss as the leading symptom. And oftentimes it has a stepwise progression. Um, it goes without saying that, and it's not surprising that this disease had a tremendous effect and impact on affected families. Uh, it, it, it really runs in families affecting about 50% in general. The future is uncertain for those affected and also those not affected yet, but not knowing whether they have the disease is all very uncertain. It gives rise to anxiety. Uh, that anxiety increases when uh, the age of 50 is approaching, when the first symptoms appear. And there's all kinds of questions. Do Should I have offspring when I have a genetic disease? 
uh, then there's a the big dilemma, should I be tested or not? An advantage of being tested is that at, certain, at least you can uh, uh, overcome the uncertainty. But then again, if, it's, if you test positive for the disease, that's quite a burden. The negative uh, choice to not be tested are, uh, you don't want to, um, I mean, the, you don't want to know about your fate. There's all kind of uh, cultural um, issues, but also practical issues like life insurance uh, that you uh, that could hinder you if you prove to be positive for the disease. So all kinds of dilemmas run in the families. The initial research, as I said, was in the 1980s and 90s, and uh, they discovered the hereditary nature, the genetical defect. I, I mentioned that. They described the disease in great, great detail, and initially it was perceived as to be a variant, a genetical variant of Alzheimer's disease. And then, for some reason, the scientific community lost interest. They thought it's a very unusual disease, but it's only in, in a couple of families, and they moved on. And the community felt abandoned. Meanwhile, the world changed because there was an increasing awareness worldwide that dementia is not only about Alzheimer's disease, but that uh, diseases affecting the blood vessels in the brain play a major contribution to, um, to dementia. And also, and Professor Greenberg here on board today was uh, really the pioneer who put um, uh, cerebral amyloid angiopathy on the map. And this is uh, a title of a paper that he published uh, couple of years back that I think is a nice summing up of the situation. Small vessels, but big problems. So um, then there was uh, in Kat Katwijk, it was initially, uh, as I said, disappointment that there was uh, no interest from the, the scientific community anymore. It's a grim disease. No, I'm sorry, this is about CA. Um, so cerebral amyloid angiopathy, the, let's say the non genetical variant of, uh, uh, of the disease described by Professor Greenberg is also a grim disease, no treatment options, disease mechanisms uh, incompletely understood. And that was because in, um, in CEA, the disease is very hard to study during life because it is very hard to prove that people are affected by the disease. Okay, there was more changes because where CA was initially thought to be a model for Alzheimer's disease, it was discovered with the increasing knowledge of CEA that actually it's a great model for, for cerebral amyloid angiopathy. It's a variant of CEA. It has very little, if anything, to do with Alzheimer's disease. And then um, it was also uh, understood that having this genetical form in Katwijk, that that type of CEA offered opportunities that were unknown in CEA. For example, it's very easy to make a diagnosis of a Dutch type CEA because you do uh, uh, a blood sample, you analyze a blood sample and you know whether the disease is involved. So you don't need brain biopsies, which are required to finally demonstrate CEA that does not run in family. And because you, it runs in families, Dutch type CEA, you know what people to test and what people are at risk. And then a big advantage is Katwijk is such a nice place that people don't move from there. They all stay there. So uh, you know where to focus your research on geographically. So you have easy access to, to, to people. And uh, then it was recognized that, listen, this population in Katwijk actually is, is, is very interesting and is a great uh, resource to actually start understanding CEA. And lessons learned in Dutch type CA may be relevant in CA worldwide. Okay, so that was part of the history. Then there was a, a few encounters in the uh, early years of this uh, millennium. Uh, I had a sabbatical leave in 2006 in, in, in Boston, and I had the pleasure to meet there, uh, coincidentally, uh, Professor Greenberg, who, as I said, is the pioneer and the godfather of CA. Um, and that was a meeting uh, at Harvard Medical School. So we started to discuss, and we, uh, he discovered I was from Leiden. I discovered he was, in, uh, he was uh, um, uh, a researcher on CEA. And then we thought, well, we should combine forces, uh, recognizing the uh, relevance of the Dutch type CEA population for 
answering scientific questions for CE in general. And that's why when we decided to write a grant together that was uh, 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 awarded in 2011 uh, by the National Institute of Health. And that was the first restart after silence in the 1990s um, of uh, research in Dutch type CA. That was one encounter. The second encounter was in 2011. Uh, that's when uh, I met uh, Janni de Vught and her daughter Sanne, who is leading uh, the session today. And they recently started, uh, before we met, a uh, patient organization of Dutch type CA. What struck me during that meeting is the enthusiasm, um, the hope, uh, despite the absence of uh, treatment. And also what struck me is how they felt abandoned after the scientists in the 1990s kind of drew back from uh, research in that arena. Um, also what struck me uh, was the, the, no, so that, that's that part. So after having talked to them, I had a personal struggle. I thought, well, you know, um, I don't want to be in the same situation as the researchers in the 1990s. I, you, you do research in the population, you raise hopes, and then you abandon them. And I thought, you can do that. So how could we uh, create a lasting commitment and lasting research uh, until the disease is treated? Um, so that was, I was thinking about how to do that. And then I met a guy called Jan Fens, who's an entrepreneur from Rotterdam, who was just before I met him, was two weeks before that, that meeting, he was diagnosed with uh, Dutch type CA, and he wanted to contribute to research. And he was convinced that other entrepreneurs might, be, might think similarly. So uh, we decided to team up, and we started the Dutch CA Foundation to start a lasting commitment uh, for research uh, um, at the IMC uh, uh, on the cataract disease, on Dutch type CEA. And later we founded the International CEA Association, which is uh, uh, organizing a um, biannual scientific me uh, meeting on CEA. So here we could um, start our lasting commitment. Then there was another commitment three years later in uh, uh, London at one of the uh, CA symposia organized by the International CA Association, and that was with Hamid Sarabi on board today. Uh, and through him, we understood there was a Dutch type CA uh, family, extended family in Albany, in Australia. So we started our discussions. We started to start a, we discussed to, decided to start a collaboration. We had follow up conversations with his close. Uh, uh, colleagues, Ralph Martins and Kevin Tede, and uh, we wa really wanted to, to uh, act together and to start a research together. And uh, joining forces ultimately uh, for, for getting a treatment. So united we stand. Um, currently we have a, um, uh, a rich research program here in Leiden, together with, uh, with Boston, uh, focusing on the Dutch type CEA. It started with the uh, the, uh, the fund from, uh, from the grant from the NIH, as I said, and that was really the first time to describe in detail using modern techniques like MRI and other markers to study the disease, to better understand what it's all about. And then Marika can explain uh, some of the uh, studies that started after that. Yeah, so after the Eden uh, finished, I thought, uh, well, what a pity because we learned so much from uh, from that study, uh, so I tried to get additional funding, uh, and I, I got a personal grant from the Netherlands Heart Foundation uh, to uh, start a, a natural history study on uh, DCAA, but also on sporadic CAA, because I was really intrigued by the variation that we see in, uh, uh, for example, DCAA patients, who everybody has the same mutation. Uh, in general, patients have their first um, hemorrhage around the age of 55, but we know that some already have the first hemorrhage when they're 40 uh, and others are 60 or 65. So uh, the aim of, uh, of the Aurora study uh, is to look at uh, um, factors that might affect this disease course. And for that, we first, of course, have to 
have a good um, clear uh, vision on how the disease develops. Uh, and that's still ongoing. And uh, we're, uh, we enrolled uh, 80 patients now, uh, also pre-symptomatic uh, mutation carriers. And the goal is to reach uh, the 100 and follow them for five years. Um, so that's um, uh, currently ongoing. Uh, and I want to have a, a short moment because I forgot to introduce uh, the team. We're not here uh, uh, by ourselves, Mark, and I was, uh, you can already see some people, uh, the PhDs and Tyson Os, uh, who are joining us today. Uh, so maybe good to know for the audience that uh, well, we have a very enthusiastic team uh, that's interested in, uh, in this research and will carry it on uh, until uh, hopefully the next uh, steps towards a treatment trial. Okay. And links on the links on. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Professor Werma. Um, so actually, uh, we're now in a situation that there's a total renaissance of Dutch type CA research. We have an extensive network uh, nationally and internationally, collaborations uh, as mentioned, Leiden, Boston, Perth, Nijmegen is another city in Holland. And we, we really try, since the data, it's not that thousands of people have the disease, it's a limited number of people and numbers count. So we really were very glad uh, for all kinds of reasons to, to team up with Perth and uh, we're really trying to, to exchange expertise, experience and richer data. And this gives uh, rise to all kinds of new possibilities because the numbers are increasing. Um, let me see, this uh, is what we discussed. Huh? There is the Dutch CA Foundation. Uh, and that's maybe nice to know. It's, it's really a very close collaboration between patients and researchers. Uh, the goal is to, uh, is to raise funds for research organization awareness an international advisory board and uh, uh, that's really a nice platform where scientists and patients uh, are on board and to drive the agenda and to reach a situation where the disease hopefully will be abandoned uh, and at the model i always like to stress we this we um, created this this logo intentionally with the key in the middle uh, because the the um, Let's say that the change in, in, in the idea was important that we explained to all kinds of people, among others, pharmaceutical companies that, yes, this is a small disease and a big disease in a small population, but it is interesting to focus on it because it harbors the key to a solution to CA worldwide. So that is something that we really very intentionally exploited and that's why we came up with the design of this model and that worked. So we organized all kinds of meetings, uh, sporty meetings, all kinds of other things. There were television uh, interviews with uh, Jan Fens. He was all over the place. We generated quite some budget. This is half a million euro in one night. And that was all um, put into, uh, a lot of that was spent on, uh, on the research. Then the CNS International CA Association. So uh, since uh, 2012, each two years, we had a meeting where all the scientists working on CEA uh, virtually are together. And that is a great platform for exchanging ideas and driving the research agenda. Uh, then the patient organization does a great job uh, building uh, awareness in the community, um, serving as a platform for, for uh, exchanging um, experiences for patients, et cetera. It's a very strong organization, well organized and uh, good, well connected through the foundation to the scientists here. Uh, there's a very strong um, uh, clinical service, uh, outpatient service, I should say, with experienced neurologists and all the other disciplines that are relevant uh, on board too. And I think with that, we built a, a unique ecosystem with patients, physicians, researchers, and companies. And uh, this is what I always like to show is that the whole world, all the researchers worldwide interested in CEA and vascular dementia, they focus now on this village. It's a different village, it's Katwijk, but it's from a well-known uh, uh, book in, 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 in Europe. And uh, uh, well, doesn't, if it doesn't ring a bell, I will <laughs> spend too much time on it. Very important is that we got the interest in the uh, of the companies, and that was really what we tried to do. 
um, because now suddenly the, the big companies thought, well, actually, we, we do have a business case and it is worthwhile to invest in Katwijk because if we do so, the discoveries made there can be generalized uh, and, and hopefully the treatment that we discover, that we discover and, uh, and develop for Dutch type CA uh, will, will, take, well, will have a big chance to also be relevant for a CA worldwide. So that is really, that was a game changer. We started preparing for a uh, consortium already two years ago uh, with, again, the patient organizations, the Dutch EA Foundation, uh, researchers from our international network and pharmaceutical companies. And that was the starting point uh, for this consortium that we probably will discuss later during this session. Is that right, Sanna? Yep, that's right, yep. Okay, so. Thank you. This was uh, our contribution. Thank you so much for that overview of the history of uh, uh, research into DCA. I'm sure uh, that it was um, even complimentary for the people here in Holland because uh, we've been doing this for about 14 years. And I think it's good that every once in a while we um, uh, just have a little overview of what happened during the in those 14 years because uh, the situation got a lot more hopeful for us uh, family members and uh, sometimes we feel that it it's never soon enough so we're always hoping that you can go faster but uh, a lot of stuff is happening and that's uh, good to know so thank you for that and we're going to come back to you later for um uh the explanation of what the new study entails. Um, I'm going to go to Stephen now. Uh, Stephen, who is the co-captain with Mark, <laughs> uh, and he's going to tell us more about his view on the relation between CA and DCA and um, how that relation has led to the consortium and the cooperation of Alnylam and Biogen. So the floor is yours. Oh, one more thing. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them through the Q&A and we'll um, round them up and, ask, and uh, ask them to our panelists at the end of the webinar. Stephen. Thank you very much, uh, Sana, and thanks to professors Van Buchum and, and Vermeer for just a wonderful overview of uh, how we've gotten to, to where we are. Um, I, I'll say that um, one of the really um, striking features of working in Dutch CA is that it's um, literally one big family. Um, and that's not true of many other hereditary diseases where the same, um, uh, the same uh, genetic mutation arises separately in many different families. And here, uh, 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 literally, the, the, the people involved are part of one big family. And, if, and I feel like everyone on the call is part of one big family, uh, even those of us who uh, are not related um, that this is, as uh, uh, Professor Van Buchen showed, been a, a, a journey to get to this point um, that we've all uh, been on together and all made our contributions to. Um, and uh, to keep the, the metaphor going, uh, there's a, a, a big extended family. Of, uh, I think everybody has um, the cousins who you know and then the cousins you don't know who are outside your, your um, uh, people you, you've never met. And, and, and here I'm speaking of uh, the larger, what we call sporadic CAA community. Sporadic meaning they don't have a relative with CAA. Um, and uh, that is a really big community. Um, whereas um, uh, the, the people with uh, Dutch CAA uh, form a, 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 a sort of a, a smaller group at the center um, the people affected by CA is, is truly a worldwide, um, a fairly universal condition. So um, people estimate that something like 25% or 30%, one out of four or one out of three um, people will have um, at least what we call moderate to severe CAA uh, as they grow older. And that makes it an extremely common problem. Um, uh, in many of those people, it will contribute to late life cognitive decline and is part of the picture of what causes cognitive decline with aging. And um, 
and for a, a, a subgroup within that group, people have hemorrhagic strokes and the disease for them looks very much like um, Dutch CEA except starting at a later time in life. So, and uh, when, when, when uh, Mark showed uh, the key that how Dutch CEA may be the key, I think that really underlines the fact that there's both um, uh, a bad side and a good side to um, the Dutch CA. I don't have to tell anyone on the call the, the bad side is that this is a disease hanging over people's heads at ages much too young uh, to be um, uh, in, in the normal course of life to be thinking about stroke. And that is a tremendous burden on the families. And I, I don't have to reinforce that for anybody on the call. That's the bad news. Um, the good news is that um, because of the genetic nature of the disease, you know about it years before anything um, appears um, on MRI scans or any type of stroke. And that provides a, an opportunity to treat the disease at a stage that uh, otherwise can't be treated. And I think that's that um, pretty clearly is what attracts the pharmaceutical community and, and um, uh, Mark mentioned the companies who are part of the consortium Biogen and Alnylam. And I, I just mentioned here that um, none of us works for a drug company. Uh, uh, all of us uh, work for our, our funders, the, the government funders, and we work for you, the families. I mean, it, it's, uh, I think our, uh, the, your, 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 our, um, uh, our, our bosses, our constituents, not the, the pharmaceutical companies, but um, uh, and uh, anyone who watches movies knows uh, that, that uh, if you see somebody from a drug company, uh, you can be pretty sure they'll be the bad guy in the movie. Um, and um, uh, people worry, uh, oh, they, they have their profit motives. Will that cause uh, trouble? And um, it's been very easy to work with Biogen and Island. They have allowed, I, I, I know correctly, the, the scientists and the uh, representatives of the patient community and the Dutch CA Foundation to take the lead on all of the activities that we're doing, they're, they're smart. Um, and they are um, both companies that have a track record of what I'll call breakthrough treatments. They're both companies that um, have developed um, new kinds of treatments for diseases that are otherwise very difficult to treat. And this is of course what we need in Dutch CAA. This is Dutch CAA and CAA in the larger community are largely untreatable conditions and we need breakthrough treatments. And um, the, the fact that they have developed um, candidate breakthrough treatments um, comes at the same uh, time that the research in um, all of the other building blocks for a treatment trial uh, have advanced to a, a very high stage. And I would say that um, everything that has happened has sort of brought us to this moment where we have um, the tools, the, um, uh, the tests uh, like MR, the different MRI scans that probably many people on the call have participated in, um, the tests of the fluids, the cerebrospinal fluid um, uh, that bathes the brain and, and blood that are informative in um, CA. And now we have potential breakthrough treatments. It is too early to know what those treatments will look like. Um, uh, we have discussions, but we do not know the answer of what will look like. We do know um, uh, the general types of uh, breakthrough treatments that are being considered by the companies. Um, one that we are very excited about is, um, I'll use this term, RNA targeted treatment. So if everyone can kind of uh, take yourself back to, um, in the US, it would be high school uh, biology. Um, and remember uh, the, the DNA codes for the RNA, which then codes for the proteins that carry out the work. And targeting the RNA is a, a, a very um, exciting strategy that has now been used for other, especially um, genetic diseases, um, that by blocking the bad RNA, you can block making the bad protein. And uh, uh, one of the really attractive things about this approach is that it's very targeted. Um, it, um, uh, it allows you to develop treatments that really don't affect other pathways, that really target the bad pathway. 
Um, I'll mention because I think that the question has come up. This is a technique that does not make any use of uh, embryonic um, cells or embryonic tissue. Um, it's uh, purely these uh, treatments are, are um, uh, uh, synthesized by uh, machines without any use of uh, human tissue or embryonic tissue. It's completely distinct from those. Um, and a question that comes up uh, that we've discussed a lot with potential participants um, in the study is the, the need for uh, these lumbar punctures, the, the needle in the back to um, sample the spinal fluid. And the reason that that is an essential part of any RNA targeted treatment is that the RNA that is being targeted is made only um, in the brain. And uh, to know that the treatment is working, you need to sample the the, the fluid around the brain. And this isn't anyone's favorite part of uh, participating in a research study, but it is um, uh, built into these breakthrough candidate treatments targeting RNA. And, uh, and I'll, I'll close in saying, uh, you know, I, I, I love the title of this session, The Future Is Now, this idea that everything has brought us together to this moment when we have um, the, the tools that we need, we have um, the um, commitment of the, the, the community, of, uh, the scientists, sure, but first and foremost, uh, the families. And um, uh, we collectively, the people on the call, this call are the people um, who um, uh, are in charge of what to do. Um, and it will, uh, if we all agree that this is the time to um, potentially stop this treatment right in its tracks before it can cause bleeding, then we have the ability to do that. And at different times, we've called the, the study um, that we're just starting now, we've called it at different times, track DCA because we're tracking the disease or the natural history study. but. There's another part of that, um, which is the trial run-in study that we hope to use designs that will allow the participation of people right now in the study to contribute to our ability when we begin um, to uh, use treatments as part of the study in the, 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 the upcoming phase. And of course, that is why the pharmaceutical companies are involved is to make that phase possible. So I'll look forward to answering questions that people have, but I, I um, I, I think that um, there's, uh, for all, speaking for all of the scientists on the call, this is the most exciting time that this field has ever seen, that, that all of the years, uh, uh, Mark beautifully spoke about the, um, the sense of um, uh, abandonment among uh, at least some of the Dutch CA community when, when research sort of stalled out. And um, I, I think that um, this is the, um, I don't want to say the reward, this, but this is the, the culmination of all of the efforts that uh, the scientists and particularly the families have, have made to get to this point. Uh, we don't know what treatment will be the one that stops Dutch CA, but we know that we have strong candidates and the tools to test them and show that they, we hope, work. So thanks to everybody for their time, and I look forward to questions uh, at, at the conclusion of our, our time together. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, uh, for that. And uh, also, I like the um, the image of us being a big family because um, I know it feels like that for me and um, uh, with you guys um, and also with the Australian families, I hope they feel like they're part of the community as well. Um, we have very close contacts, of course, through the association and the foundation with you guys. And I think it's good for everyone to see um, how committed you are and uh, how hopeful you are right now. So thank you uh, for that. Um, you uh, hinted about the CA community. I just, just a short anecdote uh, this morning, my, uh, one of the old teachers of my mom here in Katwijk of her um, primary school uh, was visiting us and he is, has CA. So uh, he is also part of our family, not having the genetic, um, form of CA, but still part of the uh, Dutch CA or CA family. And uh, I think he's, uh, hopefully he figured out how to use the Zoom link and he's here with us. So Mace Case, if you're watching, I hope you enjoy it. <laughs>
Um, we're going to go to uh, Mark and Marika, who are going to tell us about TREK, DCA, and what the study entails. So the floor is yours. OK, maybe to uh, start this, and then I'll uh, hand over the, the mic uh, virtually to Marika. Uh, but I already explained how, over the years, kind of people and organizations uh, popped up and, and put their act together. And uh, in 2019, we had our, had our first conversation in Leiden with the people from Perth over, and uh, Steve and members of his team over, and we decided to start uh, this consortium, to organize a consortium. And then the next step was to find companies who were interested, and those were the companies that uh, uh, Professor Greenberg just mentioned, uh, El Nylum and Bijan, and uh, took a while to, to organize all the, um, all, the, uh, all the lawyers and everything, but there's a, a well-designed contract now in place and nothing prevents us now from, from starting. And actually that's what uh, that we did. Marike, uh, Professor Wormer will tell you more about uh, what the study did track Dutch CEA study is about, yeah. Marike. And uh, I think with the consortium, we agreed that it's, uh, although we learned a lot already from our previous research that we uh, really need some more information, especially on the biomarkers to really get started with a treatment trial. And that's why we designed the track DCA study uh, for the Dutch uh, uh, viewers, um, <laughs> which is, uh, uh, quite similar to the Aurora study, although we are uh, doing more in-depth uh, investigations now. Um, and what it entails is that we want to include uh, 100 uh, participants uh, on two sites, so 50 uh, on every side, uh, and that's uh, here in Leiden, but also in uh, Perth. And um, it will be a study that will uh, take two years, so uh, with three study visits, so the participants uh, come three times, in total, uh, first for a baseline visit, then for a one-year follow-up, and then for a second-year uh, follow-up. Um, and what uh, we then, uh, well, the study day, uh, of course, that's different uh, based on different uh, logistics uh, on both sides. But here in Leiden, it's a two-day um, uh, visit where we uh, do a, a two MRI scans, so a three Tesla and a seven Tesla. In Perth, it's only the three Tesla MRI. Uh, we do a lumbar puncture. Uh, Steve already uh, explained how important this is for this uh, study. Um, and also a PET scan, which is new uh, for us here in Leiden. So that's also different from the Aurora study. And in addition, we do a lot of uh, neuroscience psychological and neurological uh, tests uh, to get a good uh, view on how uh, everybody is uh, functioning and some blood uh, tests. Um, we include uh, participants between uh, 25 and 60, year, 60 years old who uh, are known with uh, the mutation, uh, have been tested or have at least one uh, first degree relative with the mutation. And um, furthermore, it's important that uh, it's um, allowed to have a maximum of one symptomatic hemorrhage uh, if that's more than one year uh, ago. And of course, you uh, do not want uh, people who have contraindications for MRI scans because they have uh, iron devices. Uh, so um, we have that as an exclusion uh, criteria. criterion. Um, so that's the uh, setup of the study. And um, yeah, we're very happy that we just had the first participant and already, uh, I think, uh, 13. And look at the, Marilyn, our research nurse, uh, uh, that's, uh, that are already uh, coming up uh, in the next weeks. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we made, a, I think, a good start. And we hope that uh, Perth will also start uh, within the next uh, months. And I'm happy to answer any questions if, uh, if there are any questions from the audience about uh, the study, which is called the TREC, uh, TREC DCA study. And in the Netherlands, we also use the term Aurora Plus. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the uh, information. We don't have any questions yet, but I just want to emphasize one thing. Could you uh, tell us the age range in which people yeah, are? 25 to 60. 
Right. So uh, people within these age ranges are yeah. um, able to participate. Um, and one other thing that I like to emphasize that uh, at least here in Holland, we can make sure that uh, people can participate who don't want to know their genetic status. You have everything logistically um, planned in such a way that they can never find out, right? Yeah, and uh, if uh, you do not fit into the inclusion criteria because you're either too old or too young or have too much hemorrhages, then you can still participate in the ORA study, so uh, in the Netherlands. So. Yeah, yeah. So anyone who has uh, yeah. applied so far, if they are not eligible for uh, track DCA, they are still eligible for other uh, research projects. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. I don't see any questions so far. So if anyone, please, if you have any questions, um, uh, send them through the Q&A and we will make sure we ask them uh, to our panel. So um, do that if you like. Um, we're gonna go to uh, Ralph. Uh, Ralph and Hamid are representing the um, Australian team and they are gonna give us a history of the participation of the Pluck family uh, in uh, Diane and uh, their current involvement in the consortium and track DCA. So Ralph, the floor is yours. Thank, thanks, Anna. So just to state up front that uh, Hamid, uh, as, as we mentioned, is a key player in this program as part of our team and Kevin is somewhere, I'm sure he's, he's online somewhere and, and, and uh, uh, Samantha Gardner is playing, playing a key role. So this is our core team. Uh, just, uh, I've been working in Alzheimer's for the last 35 years, starting with the uh, identification of beta amyloid in, in the lab of Colin Masters here in Perth. Uh, and uh, we've gone all the way now towards looking at uh, prevention and, and, and therapeutic approaches for Alzheimer's disease. But about 12 years ago, uh, actually 13 years ago, uh, we were approached by uh, colleagues in Washington uh, and, and they uh, wanted to bring together people who have mutations in Alzheimer genes, and, such as the APP gene of which uh, you know, your family is also a, a part of, in a sense, uh, and uh, pre one genes. And the problem has been is because it's so rare, nothing was done for these families. And the consortium included um, uh, seven sites in, in, in the United States, one in the UK and three in Australia, and our Perth site was one of them. Uh, now, at that time, I didn't know anything about uh, the, the Dutch CA families in, in, in Perth, but uh, I was fortunate enough that uh, Dini Plug uh, uh, called me and said to me that she has uh, uh, APP mutation in her family, and it's a very, very large family. And I wasn't sure whether she was serious until I met up with her and found that that was the case. Uh, and sadly, a bit like the abandonment that was felt in, 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 in Holland, a similar situation happened in, uh, in Perth because there were some clinician researchers who looked at the family, identified the gene, uh, wrote a paper, and then left them hanging. Uh, and that's when Dean came to me. Uh, and so one of the things I tried to do was to get uh, uh, Dini's families in Perth to be part of Diane, even though they were not... Uh, uh, definitely Alzheimer cases. They had a, uh, an Alzheimer-like gene. Uh, and uh, I was very grateful to uh, the head of the study, Professor John Morris in Washington, uh, to allow me to, to bring these families into the study. And we've been following them now for the last at least 12 years. Uh, and, and Diane has went to a similar track to what uh, track uh, 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 Dutch CA will, is going to be heading towards. But we started off with an observation-based study. Uh, for several years, and that led into uh, a, a, a clinical trial, so we call the Dines uh, TU uh, study, which where now three drugs have been evaluated that low amyloid. At the time when they were discussing with pharma companies to do this, I was very vocal about getting uh, uh, the plug family uh, into this uh, into this uh, these drug trials, but. So unfortunately was outwatered and mainly because the concern was that because of bleeding, they, they felt that the whole trial would be compromised. So again, this was like a second sense of abandonment, but it was, it was I guess, it, there was nothing much we could do about it. But, but at least we were allowed to pursue with letting them be in the study uh, for ongoing uh, till we found uh, another source of funding. 
And fortunately for us, uh, through Randy Bateman, who now heads Diane in, in, uh, of this other consortium for, for, for Alzheimer's, uh, he introduced us to Steve Greenberg, Professor Steve Greenberg. Uh, and we invited Professor Steve Greenberg to Perth. And he uh, gave a presentation to many of uh, Denny's family members. And we were very impressed with their enthusiasm that came from all over, particularly from Albany, and was pouring with rain, just like it's doing today, but probably not as bad today as it was then. And so that just demonstrated their level of motivation and interest. Uh, and we had a number of uh, meetings with Steve, who was very passionate about really making a difference. And the first thing he talked about was his colleagues in, uh, uh, in, in Holland, uh, Mark and Marika. And he said, you know, you guys should join forces. Uh, so Steve really uh, is the bridge builder bringing us together uh, to take us to that level. And we've learned uh, many things from Diane that I hope to uh, will benefit uh, this study going forward. In particular, uh, uh, we've been looking at blood biomarkers. Uh, and uh, you know, when we started looking at it about 10 years ago, these biomarkers were not looking very good uh, in terms of the accuracy. Now we're at a stage uh, for Alzheimer's, we're getting like greater than 90% accuracy. So they're as good as, as say a brain scan uh, and very shortly a test will be out uh, for Alzheimer's. But I, I'm, I'm intending to apply this uh, to look at some of these biomarkers and maybe other new ones uh, for our uh, 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 Dutch CA uh, cohort uh, to see whether we can pick up changes very early uh, as the condition progresses in the brain. So I think we have a lot to offer, but I think our combined strength, I love this word of being one family, our combined strengths will really make a difference. A bit like the Diane court, um, some countries had like about eight to 10 people. Uh, we, between us, you know, we, we don't have enough, but together, I think we will just get, get across that, 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 that hurdle and, and make a big difference. So I'm very excited about this, uh, uh, th this venture. You know, we too will be starting relatively shortly. We've got a foundation that supports Alzheimer's primarily, but they're providing uh, infrastructure support for the study and clinical support. And we also hope to have uh, a clinical uh, facility to, to help uh, uh, people in this family. So we, we have a neurologist in place who Mark and, and Steve know very well, uh, uh, who has uh, been working with us to employ a, a very good stroke neurologist so people can come and get assistance uh, as they progress to their condition. Uh, so I'll pass it on to Hamid if you want to say a few words, Hamid, because Hamid really was the guy who developed a very, very strong relationship with Mark and Marika and took us to that next step. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I guess um, everybody in this panel is extremely passionate about this new um, study, and we, we believe that this new study can help us to understand um, what goes on um, if, if we look into the uh, different aspects of um, changes from biomarkers to uh, brain imaging to uh, neuropsychological and cognitive assessments and so on. And then hopefully we can transfer the data from this study into the clinical trial. Uh, I've seen that uh, our um, Western Australian uh, family, uh, the Dutch family here, has been extremely passionate about uh, helping us to collect data that we wanted. And I'm sure that they will be supporting us and hoping that they can encourage others to join the study and hopefully we can move forward with a greater cohort, greater number of participants that can help us to move towards the pharma related uh, uh, clinical trial. So that, that's all from me, thank you. My, yes, my video is on. Uh, thank you guys uh, for um your perspective from Australia. Um, I think I, I, I just wanna make sure that everybody understands what a biomarker is, because I don't know if everybody knows. It's a, a way to kind of measure the disease. If, if I'm saying this wrong, please correct me, but they're trying to find ways, the, the most accurate ways to be able to measure the, the process of the disease before the first hemorrhage. So we all know that when you're a gene carrier, um, the disease doesn't start 
uh, with your first hemorrhage. And this is very important because um, it's also a way to measure the efficacy of a potential drug in drug trials. Um, I just wanted to explain that to the people in our audience who don't know that. Um, the next uh, point on our program was for, um, for me actually, oh, that's me, okay. <laughs> um, to tell you a little bit about our campaign, uh, stop the cutback disease or stop the cutback ziekte that we have uh, we've been campaigning campaigning since May uh, here in the Netherlands and we've done that through um, uh, posters on the side of the road advertisement in local papers um, and online um, uh, advertisement through Google and Facebook and other social media um this project was a uh joint project between the patient association the dutch ga foundation and uh, the team in leiden so we uh designed the whole campaign uh, together um and the purpose of the campaign was to motivate people to participate in uh research so as Marika has already said, uh, there are already 80 people, 80 people from Dutch families that have participated in research so far. Um, and that's good. Uh, kudos to those people and also to the people in Australia who are participating. I think you've been participating for over 10 years. So uh, that's uh, uh, full credit to you for, for that. Um, uh, we're hoping that more people from the GA families decide to uh, participate. And basically the message of the campaign is um, if we want there to be a drug trial in our future and a possible treatment, it's up to us to, um, to participate in research. So sometimes people uh, have some anxiety about participating, which makes sense. Uh, I mean, it's a confrontation with a disease you rather not think about. So I understand that people feel um, anxious about participating. Um, we're trying to get the message across that why it's so important to participate. Also that there are very nice research teams um, that um, are there for you the whole day that you're in the hospital. And uh, so they're nothing to be afraid of. Um, and we really need more people to participate uh, to make this study a success and um, continue it hopefully into a drug trial. Um, so far, uh, 110 people um, uh, contacted us uh, through the campaign, so that's great. Um, as you have understood probably by now, there are some criteria for every study. So 100 uh, people or 110 people contacting us does not mean that there is all 110 of them can uh, participate in the new study track. Um, but if not, in Leiden, they can participate at least in the Aurora study, other studies, and the Stombo Mondeshoek, so the pedigree study. And um, uh, so none of the applications is lost. Um, I'm talking to uh, Team Australia about um, how to translate this campaign to your family as well. Of course, the situation is very different because uh, you are one family and over here we are dozens of families that are um, impacted by DCA. So uh, the approach is probably gonna be different, uh, but I'm hoping that uh, through this webinar and uh, of course we're gonna continue the information um, that lots of you get motivated to participate in uh, TREC. Um, um, Mark has already touched the uh, talked about the importance of the lumbar puncture. I have this on the agenda for Marike and Mark. Uh, also, uh, would you like to um, talk about this, or do you feel like it's covered? 
maybe one additional comment i think uh, that why it's so important uh, uh, besides the reasons already uh, been mentioned is that uh, we know that the mri abnormalities um, uh, develop uh, usually around the age of 40 50 uh, in general but in the csf we can also the spinal fluid we can already see some changes uh, in people who are around the age of 30 even. And that will be very important if we want to look at the effect of treatment trials. Um, as you explained, and it's very uh, um, important to have biomarkers because if we want to you know, uh, look at the uh, number of hemorrhages that occur, then this trial will probably take uh, decades uh, before we learn uh, whether it works or not. So we need a biomarker to, uh, to see if the treatment is effective. And of course, we also want to have a biomarker that um, is very uh, reliable in, in young uh, people. Uh, and then we cannot really rely on the MRI. So we think that therefore this uh, cerebral spinal fluid is uh, very important to identify these uh, biomarkers that are needed to hopefully uh, in a few years uh, measure the treatment effects. So that's just one uh, addition I want to make. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. For, uh, reasons, yeah. Um, and I think the, the goal of that is um, on the long um, term that you want to be able to stop the disease or slow down the disease. So you have to be there at the right age, right? To, to uh, give drugs, <laughs> things like yeah. that too. Yeah. We want to start early, of course. If there is treatment, I think that uh, we hope that we can start early with the treatment. Yeah. Yeah. Probably we can prevent... Uh, damage yeah That's exactly course, yeah. Course, yeah and for now the lumbar puncture is the most um efficient uh biomarker there is and it's also the most so you're the study is over two years right people come back a year two years and you're going to compare the results of the uh the app in the um uh cerebral fluid over those two years, and that's probably the best way to measure yeah. that. And we also will look at new biomarkers uh, that will also increase our insight in which mechanisms play a role in the disease, and hopefully maybe can identify new treatment targets. So it's very important uh, CSF for the research. Yeah. Yeah. Thank but of course, it's a burden for our participants. We, we know that and we understand that, but it's uh, of great importance. Yeah. Um, when I talk to people about the LP, I also say you don't do it for your own. Uh, it's not a picnic <laughs> to do the LP. Um, so it's up to everyone to decide whether or not to participate. And uh, I think the um, uh, experience is very different for people. So some people don't have any um, problem with it, not during, not after. Some people have some headache, headache afterwards. Some people say, I'll never do it again. I say that, honestly, the, those people are there as well. Um, but I also always say, it's F, it must be safe, otherwise they wouldn't be allowed to do it. And it must be important, very important, otherwise they won't be allowed to do it. Is that right? It's absolutely right, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, just for our Dutch audience, if you're participating in Aurora and you're thinking, can I go into track? Uh, the research team in Leiden is uh, working on selecting the people from Aurora that are also eligible for TREC DCA. And so if you are, you will be contacted, right? Yeah, okay, good. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to Dini, who is from a Australian, uh, the Australian family with DCA, and she's going to tell us a little bit about why she thinks um, their participation in research is important. So Dini, the floor is yours. Hi. Um, as a family member with um, HCHWA in the family, um, I would actually really encourage all the people who are eligible to join in the um, study to join in as much as possible. Today, we've heard about the development, the from its diagnosis to the current importance in research. Um, I think that's really, really promising. Um, in my opinion, I think it's a privilege 
I know ACHWA or Dutch CAA, whatever you want to call it, isn't nice. But at the same time, it's it's actually a privilege to be in a position where um, where we can give something to so many people. Now, I know to start off with, it's for our family, it's for ourselves. And I think that that is paramount in all of our heads. Um, but on top of that, it's not just for us. For a bigger context, it's for a bigger world benefit from the information that we actually can share. So this is actually a really, really exciting time in that, I'm sorry, my internet's unstable. Um, this is actually a really exciting time because the current research is now focusing on ATHWA. It's focusing on what we have in our family. Um, and the amazing thing is, is that our family is so very small, but yet it is actually very important. Um, so um, we've got a chance of finding a solution, maybe not immediately, but somewhere in the future, there may be a solution for us. Um, and it's that with that in mind, and um, we're part of a big thing. We're a family, yep, yeah, that's all good. But we're also part of humanity. And that sharing with humanity is, is an amazing thing that we can, we can give to others. Um, so that's why, especially for the people in um, WA who are seriously, who have been invited to join, I know that joining in with the study is a sacrifice. You have to deal with it. Well, you have to face it um, whenever you go in for your testing. But um, at the same time, it's being part of something that is working, something that could result in, in big things. Um, so anyone who's been invited to join, Please seriously think about it. it. Doesn't promise immediate results. It's look a long-term aim, but there is hope for us. It's a fantastic opportunity, um, and that's why I also want to emphasise that it's not just my generation. The um, I think most of the people who are in the current study are my generation, my age, but you know the younger generation are now getting old enough and they're responsible enough to take on this as well. Take the call seriously, please. Think carefully about it. If you can join in, join, come aboard. But even if you can't, encourage others and stand by others because um, there are times that it's pretty tough having to um, face the consequences of ACHWA. But at the same time, um, we're not alone. We're together. And it's a good thing that we are together. And that family business, it's, it's funny how we have a big family, which has become even bigger because of it. So um, if you get the call, think about it seriously. Thanks. Can I just say a quick uh, uh, comment, uh, Sana? Yep. Uh, uh, th thank you, Denise. That was wonderful. Uh, you know, uh, really, it was one person that was you who led to us being here today. Uh, you know, and so you, you got us interested and uh, we, we are committed to you. And I'd like to say my team and I are committed to, to you and your families in Western Australia, but we need their participation because otherwise uh, we, we are not gonna uh, achieve objectives. Uh, but you, it's so well said uh, to the family that you're giving to others, but you're also giving to yourselves and you will get all the support that we can provide here in WA. Uh, like I said, even from the clinical perspective. Uh, so please, uh, uh, please volunteer uh, because we want to get the study going as soon as possible. And thank you, Denny, again. You're, you've been a real champion. Yeah, thank thanks, Denny. That was, that was beautiful. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for being here today and for, for uh, sharing that with us. Um, I think that let us 
directly into the questions because as Dini said, we're kind of calling upon younger generations to participate in the study. And uh, I was wondering if um, Marike or Hamid could give us the inclusion criteria for the study, just to make sure that everybody understands what they are. So uh, I don't know, Hamid, uh, do you want to uh, talk about the inclusion criteria? Or... <laughs> so the, no, the age... you, you go, Marika. <laughs> so the age limits uh, I already mentioned is 25 to 60. Uh, and then uh, the next um, uh, thing is that uh, either you have to know that you have to have uh, the mutation or you have uh, at least one uh, first degree relative uh, who has the mutation. Um, and furthermore, there was also a question about that. Um, it's allowed to have a, a, a maximum of one symptomatic hemorrhage. And it means that it's not a problem that if we uh, make an MRI and it turns out that there are, are several microbleeds and you never notice that, uh, that's not a problem. But if you have been admitted to the hospital multiple times for uh, several bleeds, then it's not possible to participate. So there's a maximum of one symptomatic hemorrhage with clear clinical symptoms. Uh, in symptomatic hemorrhages that are not um, uh, important, at least not for the inclusion uh, criteria. And then on the other side, the exclusion criteria are uh, mainly, uh, you have to undergo an MRI scan. So uh, already uh, talked about, uh, you know, iron devices, it's a magnetic scan. So uh, that's important to realize um, some people are very claustrophobic, so they're afraid of small uh, uh, spaces. Uh, that's a contraindication for the MRI and for the PET scan. Uh, if you're, for example, pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, that is an uh, exclusion criteria. So I think that's that are the main uh, things. And you um, uh, don't have to know your mutation status. So if you have, uh, for example, a parent with uh, DCAA, and you want to participate, uh, you can participate without you knowing your mutation status. And if it turns out that uh, you don't have the mutation, then you're just uh, you know, a control, which is also very important for the research, but you will not know that yourself. And if you uh, want to know the mutation status, I'm not sure how it's arranged in Australia, but in the Netherlands, then you uh, go to the uh, genetic clinic, and then that, that's uh, apart from, so aside from the research, it's really in the clinical uh, setting that we uh, uh, do the test and give you all the information about the pros and cons of genetic testing. So you can participate if you don't want to know your mutation status, or if you don't want to know the results of the MRI scan, that's uh, all possible, that's no problem. Yeah, thank you. It's a question I get from people. Uh, if I want to know my genetic status and I participate in the research uh, in track, DA, um, track DCA, can I get that result? And the answer is no, because you have to go through. There's a whole process and there's a reason yeah. for that process as well. If you want to know, at least in Leiden, uh, we have uh, a clinical workup uh, where you get all the information uh, uh, and then uh, you can make the decision together with the clinical geneticist. So, uh, yeah, exactly. And I'm not sure how that's Yeah, maybe it's different yeah. in Perth. Maybe so it's, it's about that. Sure. It's pretty similar to what is happening in Leiden. Uh, we don't uh, disclose the genetic results ourselves. We are not uh, permitted to do that. But we have a process that. Uh, participants can go to a genetic counselor and then receive all the pros and cons of knowing about the genetic mutations and then they can do the blood test and uh, they will receive the uh, uh, information if they want to. Yeah. Hamid, if you want to stay on for a little bit because I got another question for you. Uh, somebody is asking, uh, I am already participating in Diane. Can those results be transferred to the new study? So um, we are start, uh, starting the new uh, track uh, CA uh, study as a very sort of new study, starting fresh uh, with inclusion ex and exclusion criteria that haven't been used in Diane. Some of those inclusion and exclusion criteria 
uh, belong only to this study. So that's why that we may not be able to transfer those information, but those uh, data that we've collected, the data that we have collected from Diane has helped us to get to this stage. And so they have been extremely informative. They have been very helpful for us, but we will not be uh, transferring or using the same data for, for this site. Um, are you informing the people that are participating in Diane uh, now individually about whether or not they can participate in track? We have been doing this. Okay. Yes. Okay. So they know that they're, they're, if they haven't been contacted yet, they will be contacted soon, whether or That's not true. they. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, <laughs> let's see. We've covered the inclusion criteria. Um, somebody asked. Can I participate if my uh, grandmother or grandfather was a gene carrier, but I don't know if one of my parents is? Um, who wants to cover that question? Can I give this one to Marika? Oh, you have to. Yeah, so then, then you cannot participate if you don't want to know the uh, mutation status because then you only have a second. Uh... A degree relative, uh, so you can participate, but then it would be necessary to know your mutation status because um, we only include first degree relatives uh, who do not want to know their mutation status because then there's a 50% chance, and for a second degree relative, it's of course uh, less uh, chance. So yeah. it's still possible, but then mandatory to know your mutation status. Yeah, exactly. And that is because you want as many people included in the study that uh, are a gene carrier. Yeah, so exactly. With, so with, yeah. yeah, of course, it's not, not a problem to have a few controls. Uh, but uh, if we have too many of them, then we do not uh, learn enough about the uh, carriers. So uh, that's the reason. Yeah, exactly. And if you have a 50% chance and you're participating, you won't find out your own genetic status. But if you turn out not to be a gene carrier, you're part of the control group. So your yeah, information is just as that. important. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. thanks. Um, I see a question about Kevin shared something with us. He said for the WA families, um, the track DCA will be done at the Australian Alzheimer's Research Foundation Clinic on the key QEII campus. And for those based in Albany, we know it's quite a travel, but like the IN, the track study will support the participants by providing accommodation and support travel costs for the time spent in Perth. So there will not be a financial burden on the participants. I think that's uh, for the Dutch audience, Albany is about a six hour drive from Perth. So we only have to get to Leiden, which is about 15 minutes. Uh, they have to get to Perth, which is about six hours. So um, uh, they have more obstacles to participate than we do. Let's put it that way. Um, let's see, I think I have another question. Um, I don't know if I'm a gene carrier for a DCA, but I am 54. So I'm guessing if I am a gene carrier, I've had a few bleeds. Uh, does that mean I can't be part of the part, uh, study? And if I can't be part of the study, does that mean that, uh, or does that mean that I will be rejected for the study? So she doesn't know if she's a gene carrier, but she's 54 and she's wondering uh, if that means that she might has a, have a few uh, microbleeds, and what does that mean for her participation in track? Um, I'm going to go to Marika probably. Yeah, so uh, maybe I already answered uh, this. Uh, so you can have uh, asymptomatic uh, bleedings on your MRI scan. Um, so uh, that's not a problem, but if you have a large at a large bleed with clinical symptoms uh, and you have that more than once then uh, you cannot participate uh, and if you're uh, if you don't know if you're a carrier then uh, that's not a problem but it's uh, mandatory to have at least one first degree relative with the disease exactly yep. yeah yeah um, um, oh, 
Sana, I'm seeing a few open questions that I can maybe address. Um, one question is, does the track study involve a drug trial? And um, the, uh, as I kind of mentioned, we're, we're, we're also using this term um, trial run-in. So there's um, no drug treatment being given during the current phase. But this is really directly linked to what we believe and are working very hard to make a drug trial. And that's what we're talking about is the next phase. And there uh, are a lot of connections. One is that basically all of the same procedures that would be used in a drug trial are being used now. Um, and as I, I mentioned, there are um, ways that people participating now can um, also be contributing to the results of the drug trial because um, by knowing um, the way these um, different markers change in people not receiving a drug treatment, that gives us a comparison to what we'll see in the drug treatment and potentially allows us to um, uh, have a more efficient study. And I should say, I mean, one of the reasons we're emphasizing participation is that being able to do any kind of trial is really driven by numbers. There are a bunch of people, I think nobody on this call, but a bunch of people called statisticians um, who have uh, very sharp brains and very sharp pencils, and they work out uh, the numbers needed to be able to um, see whether a treatment is having a beneficial effect. And it's really driven by the number of people who participate. As you can imagine, if one or two people participate, we won't have any way to know whether a treatment is doing anything. So we're, we're um, everything we're doing is around making every participation um, as valuable as possible towards getting that answer. And I saw somebody else relatedly ask the question if uh, we joined the track study but had to pull out after one or two years due to pregnancy or other exclusion criteria, would the one or two times participating be pointless? And the answer is definitely not pointless, um, that uh, every uh, participation will be meaningful and, and it's our job um, uh, to uh, make sure that every piece of information that people are able to contribute by participating in the study um, will have value in getting us to where we want to get, which is towards showing whether a treatment is effective. Thanks. Uh, I, I see that we're running short on time. Uh, so if you're okay, I'm going to ask one more question, which I think is on everybody's mind. And if we didn't uh, answer your question yet, we're going to make sure we're answering it later. Um, how far away are we from drug trials in time? Yeah, we're, we're all looking at each other on the call because nobody knows the answer to it. Um, and usually we suffer from too much optimism. We, we always say, oh, uh, um, it's uh, 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 when, when my parents would drive me uh, someplace when I was a kid and I would say, are we almost there? And they say, oh yeah, we're five minutes away. And then five minutes later, I say, okay, we must be there now. I say, well, another five minutes and we'll be there. And it kept going on and on for a half hour, an hour. And, um, but I, I think it is realistic to think that the, the treatment phase would start in the next two to three years. I think that is realistic. And the best evidence I can point to is the involvement of the pharma companies. I can't emphasize enough that for all the um, negative associations that people have with pharma companies, their involvement um, means that uh, the, the prospect is uh, very much on the horizon. It's not some distant point on the horizon. It's, it's very much something uh, within reach. So, um, and I, what I, what we hope and believe is that this really will be the trial run-in study, that the information from the study will directly um, be incorporated in determining whether treatment works and that we will start a trial of one or more candidate treatments that are the strongest treatments evaluated by uh, the, the scientists and the, the, the family representatives involved and that are the ones that we think have the greatest chance of slowing or stopping the disease in its track. And I think that is a, um, I don't want to suffer from too much optimism, but I think that it's a realistic possibility that, that we may look back, uh, you know, I said this when we were in private and I'll say it again here, that we may look back on this moment and say this was the beginning of, uh, of really making a difference in the lives of people um, who have uh, Dutch type CA and people who have any type of CA that will look back and say that was the moment when we, we really um, uh, put ourselves in a position to be able to, to, to make a difference, to have an effective intervention. So um, 
Uh, it's still not tomorrow, but I think it is um, closer than it's ever been and truly um, a, a realistic possibility. Yeah. I second that. Uh, and just as to say that Diane, which is you know being 12 years in the, in the running, it took us a similar time frame before we got into the trials. So it's very, very, I'm quite confident that that's a highly likely outcome. Yep. Um, it's time for us to wrap up. Um, so uh, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, I want to uh, thank everybody for um, being on the panel today for your information. And uh, of course, for uh, how committed you are to uh, helping us find a treatment. And uh, hopefully this webinar will um, motivate some people to participate and uh, meet you in person when they're participating, <laughs> some of you at least. Um, if your question hasn't been answered yet by us because of our time frame, we're going to make sure that we're answering it on a later uh, time. So we're going to come back to you. Uh, Karen has uh, has them all in her notes, so we'll make sure that it works. <laughs> um, thank you all very much and um, see you later. Thank you, everybody.